Okay, I think we're all good. All right, yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I am John Lipper. I work for a company called ARM. Um, and I'm going to be talking about one of our performance analysis toolkits called ARM Forge and especially how it can be used to look at MPI applications and do uh, performance engineering of applications. So a uh, brief look at the schedule, such as it is today. Um, spend about 15 minutes introducing performance engineering. What is it? What kind of methodologies and tools are out there? Um, and uh, you know, why, why would we care? What, what is good performance engineering good for? Hopefully, I'll convince you. Um, and then you can look at the uh, ARM Forge software package and also ARM performance reports. And then I'll spend about half an hour showing you some exercises. So these are going to be code samples that will be available publicly that you can try on your own time. Um, I'll walk through them with Forge and performance reports in front of you so you have an idea of what they are. Um, do that up until, up until the break, following the break, do a little bit more. Um, I have some real world success stories to report from MAP and um, if you're interested we can do a deep dive into profiling uh, Lustre. That's, that's an interesting topic for some people. And some Q&A. <clears throat> so performance engineering, let's start here. Uh, methodology and tools. What, what is this? What am I talking about? Well, um, I would start by saying, you know, welcome to the age of machine scale computing. That's kind of what I call it. This is the idea that 30 years ago, we had machines like the Cray 2. Now, I was alive 30 years ago, but I'm not going to pretend I was programming at Cray 2. Um, I, was, I was eating applesauce, right? So 30 years ago, we had systems like the Cray 2, which was a really nice system, I'm told. It had four vector processors and achieved a, a record, you know, nine and a half megaflops per watt. And uh, the interesting thing I, I, I find about the Cray 2 is it was, it was built by hand. They had, um, Cray hired teams of, of women, seamstresses, who were used to uh, working at very um, fine scales so they could actually do the wire wrapping inside this system. It was, it was a human scale machine. Uh, a programmer could approach the Cray 2 and with knowledge of the machine and knowledge of his algorithm create a pretty good solution without having to uh, dive into you know, performance engineering tools in any kind of depth. Fast forward to today, we have machines like Summit, you know, a two petaflop machine doing 154 megaflops per watt at, on over two million cores. The scale of that machine is, is beyond human comprehension. We have reached a point where we, we've crossed over. Your brain is no longer enough, right? If you want to get a good result out of a supercomputer, you have to use some kind of tool. You're going to have to get some assistance because you, you simply cannot comprehend, you can't visualize two million cores operating in parallel. It, it's just impossible and I don't care how good you are, you can't do it. So performance engineering tools really are essential for achieving performance at scale. Um, especially because a, a naive optimization, you know, if you just jump in and say, oh, I know how this thing works, and you start hacking away at it, you might actually make performance worse. And I've seen that happen plenty of times. In fact, I'll give you an example before the day is done. Um, so yes, you do need performance engineering tools. This, this trend is kind of fun, you know, sidebars, like one day maybe all of us performance engineers will be out of a job. Maybe there'll be an AI out there who just writes the code for us because it's, it'll be beyond com human comprehension even with tools, who knows, but that's a different talk. <clears throat> so performance engineering is, you know, in a nutshell, it's improving the value of your code. It's the idea that we can have a, a methodology for improving the quality of your answer and improving the uh, the rate at which that answer is generated. So reducing runtime, reducing memory uh, footprint, reducing whatever, uh, pay, you know, whatever cost you pay to get that answer while maintaining or improving your solution. And this is a good workflow for achieving that. You always start by profiling your application. What does that mean? That means just grab some kind of software tool that can show you what's going on, what is happening in the system, and help you understand it at scale, right? I'm going to focus on scale, at applications at scale because at, on a single node, it's just not much to say about single node profiling or single node codes in general, right? The interesting stuff is happening on hundreds of thousands of cores, or at least thousands of cores. Start with a profile and then identify hot spots in, your, in, in certain aspects of your application performance. So uh, look at your application's file I.O., look at the communication patterns in the application, Look at how you're accessing memory or how you're using the vector units on your CPU and focus on that aspect only, right? Don't try to simultaneously optimize file I.O. and vectorize at the same time. That, that's a recipe for disaster. Pick one aspect of your performance and then work on that aspect until you can improve it. 
And what I've shown is this, these um, red numbers here next to the hotspots, 50x, 10x, 5x, 2x, those aren't speed ups necessarily. Those are the types of, that's sort of the magnitude of slowdown that I personally have seen when people make a mistake in this aspect of your code. So I've, I've seen people lose 50x speed up on their code because they made a mistake in how they did file IO. Or I've seen people, you know, if you, if you do something really silly in the way you use the vector unit, the impact might be, you know, your code is now 2x slower. So this gives you an idea of maybe you should start at file IO and work down the list. Um, and then after you optimize that hotspot, again, profile. So the profiler is really central to this whole performance engineering workflow. You're constant, <clears throat> constantly going back to the profiler. I kind of skipped a step in this chart. Um, you don't see it in, in the blue arrow there, but I'm assuming your code works, right? This, this is an assumption we all make and are often wrong. Um, so a, an important prerequisite to this is debug your code. Make sure that it actually works. So when you're going to do performance engineering, you actually need a profiler and a debugger. <coughs> um, so this is, this is where I have to step back and remind you that you know, I work for ARM. Um, I'm actually a research engineer, right? That's what I do. I'm not, I'm not a sales guy. I, I, I couldn't tell you what any of this stuff costs. This is commercial software, but I, I don't know anything about the licensing. Um, but I do need to talk about the, the product suite because I'm going to be using this vocabulary throughout the, the, the talk. So you need to know um, when I say things like DDT, what am I talking about? Um, ARM has a software package called the ARM Alenia Studio, which is composed of four major parts, the Forge, Performance Reports, compilers and performance libraries. If you get all four of those together, that's called ARM Alenia Studio. Um, half of the stuff works cross-platform. Now, I, I work for ARM, and I keep saying ARM. I want to stress that I'm talking about ARM the company, not ARM the architecture. So when I talk about debuggers and profilers here, these are tools that run on x86. They run on PowerPC or OpenPower. Um, they work on NVIDIA GPUs. They work on many, many architectures, practically every HPC architecture out there. Um, so it's, I'm, not, I'm in no way saying that this is only for you know, the Thunder X2 or only for the Raspberry Pi or something silly like that. Uh, this, these are tools that work across platform. And uh, the ones I'm going to focus on today are Forge and Performance Reports. Because this is where you can not only optimize your performance and improve performance on today's architectures, but it gives you a roadmap for porting your application forward to future architectures across platform. If you're on x86 today, maybe you're on KNL and you want to move to you know, power with GPUs, Forge is a good way to do that. <coughs> so what is Forge? Forge is actually composed of two tools, DDT and MAP. DDT and MAP come from Alenia. So ARM purchased Alenia a few years ago, I think about um, end of 2016. Uh, I never worked at Alenia. I was a, at a comp competing company, actually, when ARM did this, this purchase. Um, but I, even at that time, I knew that these are good tools, and they are kind of a de facto standard for um, debugging and profiling on HPC systems. Alenia did a really good job of selling these tools to supercomputing centers across the world. And so now, ARM maintains that original team from Alenia to support and develop DDT and MAP under the umbrella of ARM Forge. And really, the, the thing that makes Forge stand out in, in DDT and MAP is that they operate at a production scale. These are tools that will scale up to you know, hundreds of threads per node on thousands of nodes. And they can give you uh, a very nice graphical view of what's going on in the system, uh, a very intuitive display of, of performance at scale. And that's really where they're intended to be used. If you're on you know, a GPU on a single node, I would recommend you pick up NVIDIA's profiler. If you're you know, just debugging a small test case code and, and you don't need to run on multiple nodes, maybe, maybe uh, you know, GDB is the right debugger for you. But if you're going to run on many nodes and you're going to see how your performance and your stability changes at scale, you need something like Forge. <coughs> so some of the things that it can do, you can switch between different MPI ranks and open MP threads in a GUI. Um, you can uh, look at pending communications. So if you've ever written an MPI code, you've probably written a code that sends a message, oops, sorry, sends a message without ever receiving it, um, or vice versa. This is a good way to see pending messages that may never, in fact, um, be matched to, to a send or receive, and that would explain a deadlock. You can visualize data structures. This has been really fun, actually, um, in working with some guys who do uh, molecular dynamics. You can, you can pick up 
the data structures from memory, draw them out in 3D, and then see, you know, does the, uh, does, is, is, do the physics look right, in a, in a sense? An expert eye can look at that 3D plot of the, of the data and, and see at a glance, you know, if one MPI rank is, is generating the wrong answer or, or, or one thread is generating the wrong answer. A really good way to, to find that quickly. <clears throat> and then because most things break in new code, right? Usually everything works and then some guy commits his code at 2 a.m. on a Saturday and everything stops working. Um, DDT integrates with continuous integration frameworks and, and, um, and uh, source code, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, version control frameworks like, like Git and SVM so that you can track you know, what lines are the most recent. That can help narrow your search to you know, the most relevant parts of your code so you're not debugging pieces of code that have already been through uh, unit test and are known to work. <clears throat> right, I'm going to go ahead and skip over that because I talked about it. So that's the debugger, that's DDT. That'll make sure your code works. You'll get the right answer, but who knows if it's fast, right? Or if it's using the, the right amount of memory. Actually, that's the point where a lot of physicists just say, yep, I'm done, time to go get coffee. Um, but if you need to make it work at scale, it's gonna have to be efficient as well. And that means using a, some kind of profiler to improve performance. And, and the corresponding profiler for DDT is called MAP. So MAPs, a sort of distinguishing feature is that it, it operates at massive scale with very low overhead. So a lot of tools can, can do that. Um, there's a, it's kind of a prerequisite to being in the you know, petascale, exascale the space is that you can operate with very low overhead. But MAP stands apart in that it can show you uh, a, with very low overhead a very detailed representation of performance. So some of the things that make it stand out are um, adaptive sampling, MAP uses an indirect measurement approach where it periodically looks at your uh, application to see what instructions are being executed. And then it classifies those instructions uh, by, you know, is it a memory access instruction, is it a vector instruction, is it a load, a store, et cetera. And it can build a, a really detailed picture of the behavior of application over time without uh, inserting hooks or in any way changing the application's behavior. So um, you, you get a really low, low overhead um, really you know, high product productivity view of your application performance without a lot of work. Uh, and also does a really good job supporting thread profiling. This is something that many of the community tools struggle with. Um, I could list probably half a dozen tools here that claim they do thread profiling and then when it gets right down to it, they just don't in any kind of meaningful way. Map actually can handle threads uh, and does a pretty good job. So that's a good distinguish distinguisher for this over, over other tools out there. <coughs> so Map and DDT are forged. Complementary to Forge is something called ARM Performance Reports. Performance Reports is kind of like a consultant in a box. Um, a lot of community tools operate on a business model where they, they, get you, they give you the tools for free, but then the tool is darn near impossible to use, so you have to call a consultant. And the consultant can tell you what's wrong with your code and how to use the tool and get you up and running, um, you know, for the low price of 250K. So um, ARM Performance Reports is a software tool that takes the output from DDT and MAP generates a report that tells you in plain English, you know, your code is compute bound. It is compute bound at this location. We suggest reducing time spent in collectives or something like that. It can give you a report that's very straightforward on how you might optimize the performance of your code. <coughs> so here's an example. This is a, a hydro code, and it can say that, you know, you spent two thirds of your time in MPI. Hydro is MPI bound in this configuration. And I can take a look even at, you know, breakdown in I.O. time. What, where is my code spending time? It reads and writes, uh, and what is the effective process read and write rate? So without having to parse a whole bunch of data, I can just see right up front, you know, what's wrong with my code and how do I fix it? And there's a lot of uh, different metrics you can look at, like uh, if you have a SIMD code, OpenMP code with vector uh, intrinsics, say, you might get something like this where you can see time spent in OpenMP regions, you can see uh, time spent in uh, vector instructions. So in this case, our vector numeric ops are quite low, so we're getting poor vectorization, even though we're spending about 70% of our time in an OpenMP region. So good thread level parallelism, very poor level um, instruction level parallelism. Uh, you can take a look, closer look at MPI, such as you know, time spent in collectives, or uh, take a close look at OpenMP code regions, how much time was spent not just in the region, but actually the uh, OpenMP directives themselves. 
maybe you're spending 60% of your time in OpenMP, but you know 90% of that 60% is spent in OpenMP barrier at the end of your parallel region. So that's the kind of thing that will jump right at you at, at the of the report. Yes. Good question. So to provide that API, do you uh, use the like high level debug interface, or do you use the API tools interface that's coming up? That's a great question. So um, we do not at the moment use MPIT. Can you please repeat the question? Yes, sorry. The question was, do we use uh, some high-level debugging interface or do we use the MPIT, uh, MPI tools interface that, that's out there now? So um, we don't use MPIT. We do have a, a wrapper around MPI um, uh, uh, calls so we can capture, you know, bytes sent and received and things like that, but we're not using MPIT right now. There is, uh, I don't say it's on the roadmap, but there's a, a, a study at arm trying to determine if, if that is the way we want to go with this. Yeah. This is actually raises an interesting point. A lot of community tools out here already support MPIT. And that's because community tools tend to be very bleeding edge, very fast. Um, that means they're unstable. That means that they, you, they may give you the wrong answer. Um, but they are going to have that feature. MAP is not a community tool. It is a production, you know, commercial tool. So we tend to be a little slower to add features. But when we add them, we know they work. You're not going to get a build of map that t gives you the wrong answer. That's something that, as a company, ARM really insists on. So when MPIT makes sense, I'm sure uh, you know for for map, I'm sure it'll come out. And this this leads back to this. Um, you know, I, I had to sound like a salesman a bit right here and didn't talk about you know products and stuff like that. But the truth is, I just write code. I like to write applications, import them, and, and optimize them, make them go fast. So MAP is a great tool for that, and that's one I use almost daily basis now. But I want to highlight the fact that there's a lot of tools out there. There's a whole ecosystem of tools that ARM supports. Um, we, we consider most of these tools our friend. And so there's this Virtual Institute for High Productivity Supercomputing, HPS, And every year they publish a tools guide that'll show you debuggers and profilers in this space. And I'd recommend that you know after you after you check out Map and you want to you know drill into certain features like MPIT, go check out VIHPS and and see what you can do with some other tools. So that's it for performance engineering. That's it for the tools ecosystem, such as it is, such as it is today. I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking specifically about ARM Forge. Um, I'm going to show you some basic usage and cheat sheets for maybe for future reference. And then whenever uh, features come up that will be especially relevant to Inbot Pitch 2, I'll be sure to point them out. <clears throat> so first, I've shown you a lot of fancy looking graphical GUI stuff. Uh, I want to point out that ARM and MAP, they don't have to be run from a GUI. You can run them from the command line, but not a problem. You can still generate uh, off-flight reports. Uh, so, so one way to, to do this is just to um, do DDT, name your code, um, and, and you'll, you'll get, you know, uh, you can do dash dash offline actually. I'll cover that in a minute. Uh, or if you want to start in inter interactive mode, just put the word DDT in front of your command line and you'll get your application launched with DDT. Um, there's also a way to do a reverse connect. So supercomputers become complicated. We have compute nodes, we have IO nodes, we have batch nodes, we have math, you know, all these different kinds of nodes. There might be three or four network hops between you and the compute node are at least three or four. So how are you going to get a GUI running over all of this? Well, there's a number of ways to cope with that, and, and I'll show you how you can do it in um, just a couple of slides. If you can't get the GUI running at all, you can run DDT in offline mode. This is especially useful for longer running jobs. Say you have a, a job that runs on 10,000 cores, and for some reason, if you run it on 2,000 cores for an hour, it works great, but if you run it on 10,000 cores for a day, it crashes. Uh, it, it, you know, maybe there's some latent memory leak and you're having a really hard time finding it, this is a good application. Use this dash dash offline flag with output HTML um, so that you can get a, a, an offline report after the application crashes that'll show you where the crash occurred and what were the, uh, what was the memory footprint, how long did the application run, how many processes were active, were any processes hung, had any signals been received, that kind of thing. It's all, all in the report. For reference, command line options, these are some of the more you know, uh, relevant command line options. Now for InvotPitch in particular, uh, one, one of the sort of quirks that you have to watch out for with DDT is, so I've shown here this syntax, DDT MPI run dash N8, my application. This is, this is typically how you would launch your application, but for InvotPitch in particular, you omit the MPI launcher. So you would be just DDT dash N8, etc. 
And you'll get an, a message reminding you that that's the case if you try this, uh, but, but be aware of that. So if you want to control things like not just the number of processes, but actually the number of nodes, processes per nodes, then you don't use the MPI launchers flags to do that. You use DDT's flags. Those are summarized here. So in nodes and procs per node. Uh, and there's equivalent flags for OpenMP as well. For whatever reason, you can't use the OMP num threads um, environment variable, then you can just uh, use a command line option to, to DDT, and it'll take care of it for you. Question. Yes. How do you deal with multiple binary launch? So if you want to do um, sim, uh, sorry, multiple, multiple binary launch. Yes. So if you want to do multiple multiple executables, um, there, th these are, this is not a collect a complete list of, of of options. These are the options that would fit on the slide. So do uh, ddt dash dash help, and you'll get information on, on how to do that. Because I mean, as you know, even with MPI run, it gets the command lines get pretty involved. So uh, that, that's supported, but you're going to have to go to the docs. <laughs> uh, same for map. Map and DDT load from the same module typically. It's usually called Forge, or you can just add it to your path. Um, do build your code with dash G if you're debugging or profiling. Um, if you're debugging, I also recommend using dash O0 to turn off optimization. Uh, but dash G should never hurt your performance unless you're using PGI compilers. That's a different topic. Uh, but for Intel and, and GNU and ARM and IBM, just stick dash G on there uh, to get the debug symbols. To run offline, and this is actually where I find myself using map the most, is I, I usually run map in an offline mode using map dash dash profile my executable line. Again, for pitch, don't include the MPI run piece. Just, uh, just leave that bit out and keep the rest of the command line more or less the same, and you'll get the right answer. If you run it in an offline mode, instead of having the data sent up to the GUI, it gets written to a map file. That map file is auto named for you automatically, and then at a future time, you can open it with the map tool. Some command lines, uh, mostly for your future reference. ARM performance reports. Uh, so performance reports is a separate product from, from Forge. That means if you have Forge, you don't necessarily have reports. So take a look and see if there's a module called reports. That's probably the one. So module over reports will give you the perf report command. Um, perf report, again, don't include the MPI run. If you're on an InvaPitch code, open MPI and, and the others, you can do that. That's fine. Um, or if you've already run and have a map file, then you can pass that map file directly into the perf reports tool, and it will generate the report based on that previously gathered, gathered data. The report comes out in two formats. You're going to get a text report and a TXT file, and you're going to get an HTML report um, that, that you just open in a standard web browser. They're self-contained files, so you can pick them up, email them, compress them, move them around. Um, it all works. Uh, it's also worth noting that the, the map file is actually just a gzipped XML file. So if you want to build your own tools that hack it up, um, just you know rename it .gz and gunzip it, or um, and then open up the XML and have fun with it. You can do all kinds of, of great things with that. There's also options to export that data as JSON or export it as CSV. So it's very easy to integrate with other tools and, and applications. <coughs> So the GUI, um, I've shown you a couple of command line options so you can run this thing offline and look at it in, in future, but um, you know, the real reason to use these tools is it gives you a graphical user interface at scale and you can see some really amazing stuff um, with, with, without having to do a whole lot of post-processing. So how would you run a GUI in something like this, a typical um, compute cluster where you have a head node and some compute nodes um, and a client connected remotely, probably over SSH? Well, you know that the tools are ultimately going to run on the compute nodes. That's, they have to run there because that's where the data is coming from, right? So how is the GUI going to get through here, and how is it going to have any kind of performance? If you've ever forwarded X11 over, over SSH, you know it's, it's just painful. VNC is not a whole lot better um, in some cases. So, so what do we do? Well, you can run the, the GUI on the compute node and forward it if your firewall allows that. I don't recommend it. Um, you could also run on the head node and use a, a reverse connect. So in this case, you run your code. In, in, say, say you um, add DDT in front of your command line option inside of your queue script. You submit that off to the queue. Your code starts running. If you include the dash dash connect flag, it puts DDT in a reverse connect mode where the, the clients running on the compute nodes will wait. They won't run their job until they get a connection command from the head node. 
So then you can watch the GUI on the head node, it'll connect to the, the compute nodes, and you'll have the GUI running on the head node. And that's still not quite what you want to do though, because now you have the GUI running on the head node. Now there, there's some, some sites where you might use like secure remote desktop, or you might use limited in your options uh, so that you're forced to use the GUI on the head node. Um, but really what you want to do is use the remote client and then launch it from your local machine and reverse connect all the way through to the compute nodes on the back end. And this is typically what I use. Now that remote client is, is very lightweight. It's tunneling over SSH, so you're basically sending SSH commands back and forth. Um, I used it while I was on a 17 hour flight down to the Posi Supercomputing Center. So I was somewhere over the Pacific Ocean and I used this on the airplane's Wi-Fi. And, and it actually worked pretty well. It, it wasn't too painful. So in some pretty suboptimal network conditions, you get some really good performance. Um, and you don't need X11 or VNC. So I'm going to be showing lots of GUIs. I'm going to be showing lots of pictures of, of interactive debuggers and profilers. Don't panic and think, oh, I can't use this because it has a GUI. It, it, it's OK. You can use this over the network. It will be fine. Um, this is the link to installing the remote, cl the remote client. If you have a computer someplace and you know Forge is installed, you want to go try the examples while I'm walking through them. Um, you know, in the interest of time and just the complexity of getting this, the system set up, I, I didn't anticipate that anybody would follow along. But if you want to, you can go to developer.arm.com and just start looking for the HPC remote or the uh, sorry the uh, Forge remote client, and uh, you'll get to this link. And then you can download it, install it on your local system, and uh, if you need any help, just let me know. All right, so some particular things for Mbappage 2 and the latest release of Forge. This is Forge 18.1.2, came out about a week ago. There's, a couple, there's basically four points you should, you should know about uh, Forge if you're going to use it with Mbappage 2. Um, first, if you're going to do memory debugging, you need to set this MV2 on-demand threshold to the maximum job size you'd expect. So if you are going to use 128 nodes, you, you, you would set this to 128. Um, don't make that a system default. Don't put this in your bash RC file. Um, you, you really should have this on a case-by-case, as-needed basis. Uh, for instance, if you're not doing memory debugging in DDT, you're just using you know, plain old DDT, you don't need it, and you'll be paying additional overhead if, if you do. So, so only use this as needed. Um, if you're using the MPI run uh, RSH launcher, then you have to configure that in the GUI manually using these instructions. Uh, if you want to enable message queue support, then you're going to have to build in Bopitch 2 in a different way. These are not default flags. Yes? This is uh, out of curiosity. Yes. Uh, why don't you have to use MPI run if you're using in Bopitch? So is there some sort of package handling happening there? So the question is, why don't you have to use MPI run if you're using in Bopitch 2? I honestly don't know. Um, so so I, I, I don't actually do uh, the map development. I'm sure I could find out. My guess is it has something to do with the, with the Shepherd. That's my, that's my first guess. Um, but I, I would have to, you know, ask the developers why that's the case. Sure. <clears throat> and then, yes, as, as the question alluded to, and, uh, and as I've said, uh, don't start by putting DDT, MPI run, etc. Just do DDT and then whatever flags to control ranks and threads, uh, and then the, the rest of your command line. That's basically it. After, after this, smooth sailing, there, uh, the, these are uh, the, all the gotchas that I could find related to InvaPitch 2. Other than this, I mean, it's pretty much the same across whatever it is you're doing. Okay, so let's take a look at the software in action. Uh, I'm going to start with a really, really easy code here. Uh, this is going to be showing interactive debugging um, for finding crashes and hangs in the code. Uh, we're going to use a classic example, right? Uh, matrix multiplication and add. And the algorithm is, is exactly as you'd expect. We're going to have rank zero, initialize a matrix, send it out to the different workers. Um, all of those workers will perform, perform the multiplication, send the results back to rank zero, then rank zero will write that matrix into a file. Uh, very, very standard example. This, is, this has been used many, many times. Um, so if you're, <coughs> my objectives here really are just to show you the DDT interface and, and just show you what it looks like. Um, so I've got a virtual box that I can do that in. I wasn't going to connect to a remote system because that never works. Um, so let's see, I'll jump over there now. And let's make that bigger. Come on. No. Right. So the first thing I'm going to do 
build my code. And I am using MVOP pitch here, 2323, GCC 5.4.0. Um, and if I run this thing, I'll run the 4chan version for no good reason. Um, it crashes. So there's, a, there's definitely the problem here. We have an invalid memory reference. We get a segmentation fault at runtime. Backtrace, so on. So to debug this, we can say ddt in four. So I'll show you the original command line again. It was mpi run np4 so and so. If this were not in pitch 2, I would do ddt, and that'd be done. But since it is in pitch, I'm going to remove the mpi run part just like that. And this is interactive, so Forge is going to open up. I hope you can read that all right. And it's already populated this dialog for me based on the command line. It's, it's detected that this is an invapitch2 application based on the, on the executable. Uh, the dash n flag told it that I want four processors. Turn off memory debugging, I had that before. There we go. Uh, and that should be it. So from here, you just click run. <coughs> So DDT is going to go start up the MPI processes, and each process is going to have its own debugger attached to it. You can kind of see that up here. When, when an MPI code launches under DDT, DDT will pause the execution at the first or basically in, immediately after MP, MPI init. So it'll do MPI init and then pause all the MPI ranks. Let me see if I can make this a little bit larger. Yeah. All right. And maximize that. So in the center here, we have the code view. This is editable, right? If you want to, if you find a bug and you just want to fix it right there, you can fix it and then go back to your compile, your command line and rebuild and keep on debugging. So this, this is not, uh, you know, this, this is not read only. This is a, a full code editing environment. Um, complete the source code navigator, um, current variables, and stacks down at the bottom. Up at the top in this blue bar, this lists off the MPI ranks. So I can see there's four MPI ranks. If I had, uh, if I was running a multi-threaded code, like a hybrid code, I'd have ranks and threads. Threads would be listed below. And I can click on any rank and see where their current stack pointer is. So all of these are, are, are paused right after MPI init. And I can step through, so I'll take, um, I'll take rank zero, and I'll just step, step, Right. You can see execution is moving forward. This is exactly like GDB. In fact, uh, it's not a very well-kept secret, but MAP is really just kind of a wrapper around GDB. We build right on top of GDB. So anything you can do in GDB, literally anything you can do in GDB, you can do in MAP. This means even, you know, like sort of like rolling back execution, that's an advanced GDB feature. There's a way to open the, the GDB terminal in MAP and, and, and just go crazy. So stepping, checkpoints, traces, watch points, the whole thing um, that's available through map. All right, so we know we have, a, we have a crash. I'm gonna go ahead and click the play button. That's gonna continue all the MPI ranks. And we have a seg fault. Process stopped at line 168 of map 1F90, segmentation fault. The reason is address was not mapped to an object. Attempted to access an invalid address. All right, so I'm gonna say pause. So. If you look up here, you can see a couple of things. First, three ranks are, are red. One rank is green. The three red ranks are paused. So they've either just picked up a signal or uh, I've manually paused them. Or, but for some reason, those processes are not running right now. They're waiting for the signal to go. The green rank is still going. That's interesting. Why didn't he pause? Let's take a look. So let's go to rank three. Probably he just hasn't executed the invalid instruction yet. He's still within the bounds of this array. So he's still, he's still running until we, he gets the, the go ahead. All right. So we'll go back to rank zero here. We can take a look at what's wrong with this code. Well, this is your typical matrix multiplication. I, J, K. A, I, rank K, B, K, rank J, so on. This looks pretty straightforward. So what's the problem here? I can, I can hover over variables to get a little more information about them. This says that uh, A is of type real kind 8, and the bounds go from 0 to 4095. B, similarly, real kind 8, 0 to 495. And so what are these indices? Well, I can use expressions. I have two automatically generated expressions for me here. 
One is I size K, that shows 196, which is well below the, the 4K limit that we see on A and B. But look at this one. This is 125.44. That's, that's out of bounds for the 4K limit on these two arrays. All right, so we've all been staring at this code for a while. Does anybody see the problem? I'll give you 30 seconds for the code wizard to announce it. So you know, it's, you know it has to be a problem with this index because the expression here, k times size plus j, is, is 12,544, which is a lot more than 4,095. So the problem has to be either in k, size, or j. Well, size, we can see is integer in 10 n, so that's not going to change. That's going to be whatever it is. Um, size is of size 64. j is controlled by this limit, 0 from size minus 1. But k is going from size to size times size. That doesn't look right. And in fact, it's not. So the problem here is somebody just made a typo. I don't know why they thought size to size times size was correct, but the correct answer is to go from 0 to size minus 1. So we can fix that, save it, and I'll go back and rebuild here. DDT again. Actually, I'll just go straight to MPI run. All right. Well, that went pretty quick. Processing, processing, sending result matrix. Uh, so this is a 64 by 64 matrix. And I've been standing here for a good 5, 10 seconds. What, what's taking so long, right? We're, we're clearly stuck on something. So I've, I've fixed the crash. We're not crashing. Um, now we're hanging instead. All right, yeah, it's definitely hung. There's no way this is right. So, okay, we can use DDT to debug the hang. Let's figure out what's going on here. I'll go ahead and cancel that. Open up DDT again. Run it. All right, the start. And let's look at the input output tab. This will show us the console output of the application. So we can see rank three is here receiving matrices. Rank two is processing. Let's pause execution and take a look at what's going on. So on rank zero, rank zero is stuck in an MPI receive. Rank one is stuck in MPI finalized. So rank one actually got to the end of its execution. Rank two got to the end of its execution. Rank three is also stuck in a receive. So we have two ranks, both of them waiting around in a receive. Chances are somebody didn't send the message, right? There's a bug someplace. Somebody sent a message to a rank that doesn't exist. So let's have a look. Um, here's rank, well, rank zero is likely not the candidate because if we read the code, this is in the finalization section of the code. We've reached the end for rank zero. So we can consider rank zero as, as having finalized. One is finalized, two is finalized, but three is stuck somewhere. So let's take a look at the MPI receive that it's stuck at. And we can see that it's trying to send, let's see here, trying to, trying to receive from zero. Is that right? Sorry, I wish I could make the code a little bigger. Let's try it. What I want to call your attention to is doesn't help. Basically, there are com complementary sends and receives. We have a loop here going from 1 to mproc minus 2, sending data, and then receiving the same data on the other ranks. Except, why is this mproc minus 2? That doesn't make any sense, right? That's, that's our problem. We're trying to send data. We've sent data to all the ranks except for the very last one. This is, again, just another typo. It should have been from 1 to mproc minus 1. So save that, rebuild it. Run it. And it works. So we found a crash, we found a hang. Pretty straightforward stuff. And this, I mean, this is obviously a toy problem. This, this is easy stuff, right? But this is representative of the kind of stuff you'll see in the real world. And before the day's out, I'll, I'll show you a, a real world example where this actually happened. Okay, back to the slides. So 
summarize. We had an incorrect loop on the, on the k. That was easy to find because we could look at the expression for the uh, k index and see that k was going in from size to size times size when it should have been 0 to size minus 1. And in the other case, we had an i going from 1 to n proc minus 2 when it should have been i to n proc minus 1. Uh, n proc minus 1. So a message was never being sent uh, to, to match the corresponding received. So that's debugging, pretty straightforward stuff. Let's look at the profiler, map. How do we improve performance? Let's start with improving the memory axis of this loop. I'm gonna go back into this source code and uh, you probably already noticed, I'm sure a number of you noticed that i, j, k is not the optimal traversal order for a matrix multiply. It's this, um, it's a couple of problems with this. We'll get into it. But if, you, if you've done matrix multiply before, and I'm sure you have, then you recognize that this is, this is suboptimal right out of the gate. Right answer, wrong speed. So how can we improve that? All right. Well, I'm going to pick up map for this one. Myself. All right, same code, but now with the bugs fixed. Compile it. I'm going to turn on O3 and remove the debug flag because I'm I'm concerned about performance now. It, there's you know use dash G dash G is fine, um, but when you're profiling, you should also use O3. You should maximize your your optimization. Um, you know just just. Put the performance to the max. Dash O fast if you can get away with it. So now I'll time. I run MP4. I'll run the Fortran one again. All right, this is a 1K matrix. Yeah, it's decent. Four and a half seconds. Well, let's take a look at the runtime profile. So. Like before, because this is in Vopitch, get rid of MPI run, replace it with the word map. Map opens up. And just like the DDT launch window, it's already pre-populated a lot of this for me. It recognized that it's in Vopitch 2 code uh, with MPI and four ranks. All I really have to do is click run. Code runs. Yes? Oh, yes. So, what, uh, I'm assuming that was to submit to a batch queue? Yes. Okay. So, that does it actually work with batch jobs? So, when the batch jobs get scheduled, you will the map window will pop up? Yeah, so you can use a reverse connect with, with map, um, or you can use offline profiling. So, if you have a, you're, you know your job is going to sit in the queue for six hours and you don't want to sit at your laptop waiting for that, then you um, could either do map dash dash profile to have the results written to a map file offline. Or you could do map dash dash connect and then open the remote client and the remote client and the, the um, remote job will wait to, to connect to each other until it launches on the compute nodes and then they will find each other and connect. <coughs> what job tree does, does this work with other bugs? Uh, I think Slurm, PBS, I mean just, just pick one, right? Um, that I think the only one we've ever had any issues with were some versions of, of IBM's um, schedulers, but um, you know, we, we actually have a contract with Oak Ridge to get those things fixed, and, and last I saw, they were fixed. So, the, the, uh, if you find one that doesn't work, please let me know. They should work. So this is what a profile looks like in map. At the top, I've got the main thread activity. So this is picking um, basically rank zero, and um, okay, I, I spoke incorrectly. This is this is thread zero for every MPI rank. So since we only have one thread, that's that's what we've got. We can have um, Horizontal axis is time, so this is sort of the lifetime of the application from start to finish. And the vertical axis is MPI ranks, so I've got four ranks, so I kind of get four stripes of color. And then as you, you know, at some point it's going to start averaging these together or, or you know, interpol interpolating if you can't quite fit in this bar, but it's still pretty representative. So this is activity where green is, is compute, blue is communication, and then brown, there's a tiny little bit of brown over here, brown is I.O. So you can see sort of at a glance where your code is spending time. It looks like this co code is spending a little bit of time in communication, then it's spending, spending a lot of time in compute, and then it's spending a lot of time in some kind of communication at the end with a little bit of I.O. The next bar here is showing the CPU floating point instructions. 
Now remember, map uses a sampling-based approach. So, so it's periodically looking at code, seeing what's going on, what's going on, what's going on, and then building a statistical picture of the runtime performance of your application. Every time it peeks at that instruction pointer, it also looks at what kind of instruction is being executed. Is it floating point? Is it at data access and so on, so that it can draw these charts. So CPU floating point, I can see that we're actually doing a lot of floating point operations in this compute region. And, and you would see different bars for different things. Um, if it had been integer, integer math in here, you wouldn't see floating point, right? So, flo so floating point is not synonymous with compute. It actually means floating point instructions. This menu on the side has a bunch of different presets so that you can take a closer look at different types of instructions that were measured. Here's the bar for floating point, um, CPU integer operations, memory access operations, vector floating point operations, um, integer vector operations, and branch instructions. So kind of at a glance, I get a good feel for what is happening in this compute region. I can see that it's very floating point intense. Uh, it's not very integer intense. There's a little, there's a little bit right here, um, but, but not that much overall. Um, and there's a lot of memory accesses. In fact, 54% of the uh, time spent <laughs> in the application overall is spent getting data. Now that's not really great for a matrix multiplication code. You would not like to see half your time spent running out and grabbing data and bringing it into the CPU in what should be a compute bound code. This code is displaying memory bound characteristics when it should be compute bound. So we have a performance problem. Now the easiest way to find a performance problem is look down here at the bottom of the main thread stacks. You, the main thread activity, if you take that bar and you sort of break it up by code region, then you get this sort of exploded view of the main thread activity right here. So if you were to take uh, these, these charts that I'm circling here and compress them back in, into one, you would get back the main thread activity. So I can, I can see at a glance that this mmulp code, sorry, this mmulp routine is taking 50% of our runtime. I can expand that, drill into it, and try to find where is that time being spent. And it's identified this one line of source code. It says 56.5% of the, of the total time was spent on this one line. Now we can get a little better sense for what's going on there. Um, running out of screen real estate, but let me, let me expand that a bit. On the right, when I select a line of source code, I get the statistics for that line. So no statistics were gathered for these lines. If I gather, get this one, I get the statistics for that line. But let's focus on the hotspot. It tells me that 20% of the time was spent executing vector floating point. Well, that's, that's not so bad. Uh, but hold on, 85.2% <coughs> is spent in memory accesses? What is going on, right? It's, it's spending all its time getting data. It's, it's doing, by comparison, very little compute. Um, this is, this is not, not optimal, for sure. So what can we do to improve this? Well, there's a couple of, of simple tricks for matrix multiplication. One is transpose one of the matrices so that you're avoiding um, uh, uh, cache misses um, and uh, you know, ch interchanging uh, matrix, or interchanging the indices when you traverse the matrix. There's a couple of things we can do here. So uh, let me talk about that for a second. Yeah, okay, this was in case map didn't work. It worked, so that's fine. <clears throat> what we're really seeing are the, this is a performance profile typical of poor locality. And the reason I want to talk about this, because I think everybody in the room probably knows what locality is, spatial and temporal locality. These are common concepts. But the reason I want to point this out explicitly is because if you're ever looking at a profile that looks like this, or memory, oh, sorry, the, the screen doesn't change when I change. Let me go back to that. Let me see if I can. There we go. If you're ever looking at a profile that looks like this, where memory access is way above vector floating point in what should be a compute bound region, then locality should be the first thing you, you think. Right? This, this is exactly what you should be looking for if you're asking yourself why is, is, is performance poor? This is what bad locality looks like. So, start the slides. This code is not using blocking. It's not using uh, you know, a friendly memory access pattern in the B matrix. So we're just displaying both temporal and spatial locality. Uh, you're just, just not doing it. Um, 
for a quick refresher, basically if you traverse data in order, you get nice regular cache hits, but if you are going to traverse it sort of in the major stride, then you get cache misses. Um, I'm just not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I can, I can talk your ear off about locality if you're interested, but I'm gonna assume that everybody's studied this probably in, in more depth than I have. So let's use some of those typical tri tricks for matrix multiplication um, optimization. Uh, I'm just gonna transpose one of the matrices. That's an easy way, when you're looking at a chart like this, to turn the axis pattern on the bottom into the axis pattern on the top, right? Instead of striding in the major dimension, stride in the minor dimension, and the easiest way to do that, transpose the matrix. Um, you could use blocking and other things as well, but this is a good way to do it. So I'm gonna take this code where I used to have A times B, and I'm gonna make it A times transpose of B. And I'm gonna interchange the K and the J indices so that I'm still getting the right data, right? I can't just transpose it and multiply it, then I have A times B transpose. I have to do A times B transpose, but traversed in the order of B. So remember to interchange those indices as well. So let's go ahead and do that. I go to solution, get rid of my old map files, build it. And just, for, just to remind you, I'm gonna do time, I'm gonna run this guy again. 1024 square matrix processing six seconds. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Right. So, run the original code. It's about six seconds wall clock time. Run this code. with the transpose matrix, about two and a half seconds wall clock time. So it's major, major improvement. And all I had to do was change the data axis pattern. Let's take a look at the, the profile and compare it. To run with map, replace MPI run with map. I wanna stress, if you're not using MPI page 2 keep the MPI run in there, otherwise map won't know what you're doing. You were asking about the submit to queue here. So you have, I don't have a queue in this box. It, it's smart enough to tell me not to do that. Goes, runs the code. Actually, it ran so quickly that we didn't have enough time to gather a representative sampling of the code. So it's warning me that I only got 49 samples for this two and a half second long code. It went so fast, I didn't even see it happen. This is basically what it's saying. Um, if you compare the bars, I'll go back to the slide here. Not that slide, this slide. This is the before and after showing just the, showing just the main timeline. You can see how much that's compressed now. Now just the time spent in MPI finalized is dominating. You can also look at the floating point instructions. I'm hoping this, this came through with the, uh, with the low sample count, but let's see what happens. If I go back to looking at CPU instructions, so I've got, right, now I've got a really high incidence of floating point vector instructions. So not only am I improving data locality, I've actually, actually improved vectorization as well. This, this deserves a little conversation because a lot of people say, you know, you have to vectorize your code. Vectorization is everything. Vectorization is really important. Um, and I've, I've been saying, you know, since the KNC days, vectorization is a side effect of memory axis patterns, right? If your data axis pattern is right, vectorization will follow. Don't force vectorization. Force a data axis pattern that makes sense, and then your code will vectorize naturally. Um, I've even seen codes where we would do things like, you know, transpose structures and then pad them so that they'd be the right vector width, and, and it gets slower because you've in effect added more data by padding it, right? So you, you've created some, you've taken something which was memory bound and then added more memory and made it slower. Um, if you're gonna vectorize your code, start with the axis pattern, then you get the right answer and your code will vectorize. And you can see that in the profile. <clears throat> All right. So that's how to make codes faster. We made this one something about 3x faster just by changing the data axis pattern. Um, what if the code works and it seems to work quickly, but eventually it crashes, right? So this will be an example where to transpose that matrix, 
I've added a, a transpose routine that allocates a temporary matrix, does the transpose there, and then returns that temporary. The trouble is, the temporary never got deallocated. So if I run this kernel enough, I eventually run out of memory. Now, I could just launch the debugger and sit there you know, for six hours and wait for it to run out of memory, because you know, a 10 by 10, or sorry, a 1K matrix uh, is, is, I can put a lot of those in memory before this code crashes. So uh, a more effective way to do this is run DDT in an offline mode and then look at the memory leak report in the uh, offline report. So these flags here are, are very useful and I don't see these a lot and it, this, I don't see this feature in community codes as much. There's, there's a couple codes like, um, like ThreadSpotter that do similar things, um, but, but DDT is, kind of stands alone as a debugger that can do this. So you can do a dash dash offline and then uh, do output equals report.html. This will generate an HTML report of the issues encountered in your code at runtime. Even if the code succeeds, even if the code works, you'll get a, a, a report describing you know, potential issues, potential pitfalls in the code. Let's go ahead and do that. Leak. I'm going to my old report. So I'm going to do DDT. Oops. Offline. Oh, thank you. I'd love to know why PowerPoint does that. Yep, okay, DDT, offline, report, HTML, report, let's say report equals report HTML. And then I'm going to say, sorry? Dash dash output, thank you. <coughs> did, I did I do the, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Oh, and I missed another step, right? I gotta compile it. <laughs> All right, so now we have DDT offline output in for matmul 3 f 90 run. All right, DDT starts up, goes and runs the code. I've upped the size of the matrix to make this a little more obvious where the leak is. Uh, even a 2K matrix doesn't come out that, that notably in the, in the leak report, uh, but a 3K matrix sure will. So just give it a minute here. Notice that it takes a long time to write results too. You remember I said that all the ranks send the data back to rank zero and rank zero does all the IO? So you can see that there's kind of a bottleneck as, as well at the end of this code. All right, I have a log file written to this report.html. Report.html. So after the code's run, I can see what happened. Here's the uh, number of processes that were launched. I can see exactly what command line was, the timestamp when it was launched. Uh, how long it took for the code to start. So it took about two seconds for MPI and it to get to, to finish. Um, DDT then took you know just a small amount of time to attach to the entire processed group. Then we have some information about the stacks in the code. Most of the time is spent here in mult 3 I can drill into that. This is the source code for it. So by the way, map files and DDT report files contain source code. If you're working on sensitive stuff, be aware of that. Uh, there are tools like, uh, like Tau, for, instance, for, for example, does not include source code in the output files. Those are a little easier to get across fences. DDT and MAP, keep it to yourself unless you get approval because they do contain source code, as you can see here. Um, so I can see where time was spent in MWALT 3. And, oh, I forgot, I forgot one flag. I forgot to enable memory debugging. So there's no information about memory allocation here. Let's turn that on. Memory debugging in map. Sorry. Let me just show you this. If I turn on memory debugging in map, I'll get, um, if it's a dynamically linked library, it will LD preload a wrapper around the memory allocated of allocation functions. So your typical malloc, calloc, free, mmap, all of that get tracked by uh, DDT 
uh, you know, Fortran allocate statements typically just pass through to a malloc or a calloc anyways, so those get captured. But we do have uh, special hooks for Fortran implementations that don't uh, don't don't do that. So you you can pretty much count on for dynamically linked binary, we're going to catch all your allocations without issue. If you're on a Cray or some other system where things are statically linked, you need to add these flags um, to to force uh, the the wrapper to get linked uh, automatically. So. Just, just I guess, just talk to me if you need to do this on a static system. Um, but it's usually pretty straightforward. I have a question. Yes. You know how the matrix uh, multiplication, how you made it better? Mm -hmm. But you did that because you know that you can do it better, right? Okay. Um, will it offer me any insight on, you know, like it sees like all these unnecessary uh, memory access. Will it tell me like you can do better doing this or whatever or it's? That's a good question. Okay, so let's, let's Let's back up to that example for a second, and I can show you something. Um, no, sorry. So here's the in memory access. I'm building with O3 fast math, so I know this thing should be pretty fast, right? Maybe, uh -huh. maybe um, imagine this is a very complicated code, some astrophysics thing, and I'm, I'm convinced that it's as fast as it ever could be. And I'm also convinced, because I know the math, that it should be compute bound. Right, so um, I'll do a map profile of the code. Get rid of my old map files. Do a map profile on four ranks. Melt two f ninety. I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but it's a, it's a good question. So I'll run this code. I have my map profile, and now let's further assume that I I know it should be compute bound, um, but I don't know how to use, I, I don't know, you know, like when I, when I look at, that, what, let's, say, let's say that I didn't train for computer science, I, I open map and all I see are bright colors and code and I don't know what this means. So, so what is the best way to tell me that this thing is broken? Well, you can use performance reports to generate that high level sort of plain English uh, report. So I would do perf report on the map file that, just, that was just generated. It's going to read in that map file and look for indicators that this thing might be compute bound, uh, might be communication bound, memory bound. And I get two files out of that. I get a text file and a map file. Or sorry, a text file and an HTML file. I'll go ahead and open the, the HTML file. It's telling me it's compute bound. Am I in the right directory? Sorry, I think I've forgotten a flag because I'm not seeing the memory profile here. Double check that this is not the, yes, yeah, it's not the solution code. It should have said memory bound. <laughs> this is why you never do live demos. Yeah, that's, that's definitely the invalid implementation. Take a look at the text file. That's basically the same thing, isn't it? Memory. Okay. I think I'm forgetting a flag to enable memory access because there should have been another bar there showing memory. So that, rather than fumble around with this, I will keep going with the presentation, and then yeah, I'll find sure. that flag and, and get back to you. Yeah. Uh, because I, I know what you should see. Yeah, let, me go, let me open that report again. It didn't gather the memory information here, right? I've only got compute, memory, compute MPI and I.O. So I'm, I've, I've missed something. I need, to, I need to go back and measure that, and then it should, be a, should show up in the report. But answering the question, it does offer you more insights as to how to make that's the code right. better, right? Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. So I should, I should be seeing yeah. 
memory access time is high, this is your problem, go fix it. Right now it's just saying, you know, you're doing a lot of compute, which, which unfortunately would be a good thing for me. <laughs> it would be a little misleading. So let me find that flag and I'll get back to you. Um, back to the memory leak. So to remind you, the memory leak. So I ran this code, DDT offline output. So I generated the uh, DDT report.html file. I can open that report if, oh, I, I got to include the memory flag, don't I? Did I put it in my notes? Yes, that's the problem. I did forget that flag. Okay, I'll use it this time. Keep things going. Dash dash mem debug. That's the problem. Because you're preloading that library, every memory allocation has a little bit more overhead because we've got to capture it and record it. So it's not turned on by default. Um, if you're using a code like, say, Python, you would not believe how many calls to malloc Python makes. It's incredible. Everything gets malloc. You, you touch four bytes and it gets malloc. So memory debugging, uh, something like that, will, will get very expensive very fast. Fortunately, Fortran doesn't have that issue, so you'll, you'll go pretty quick. C, C++, not a problem. Python, watch out. So now we should have the memory information in the report. Yes, there it is. Okay, so now I have this button up here, memory leak report. I click that, I get a nice little bar chart showing un unfreed memory allocations when the code exited per rank. So I can see that rank zero had something like 75 megabytes unfreed memory when the code exited. That indicates a possible leak. If I click on this, I can see the function call stack that was associated with that allocate. So when the memory gets allocated, we don't just record how many bytes, we also record the source code location where the allocation occurred. Uh, and this, is, this is, brings up an interesting point because I said that MAP uses indirect sampling measurement, right? Periodically peeking at the source code to see what's going on. But you can see I'm, I'm kind of lying here because the only way you could get this kind of data is to insert hooks into your code and use a direct measurement methodology, right? I would never know how many bytes got allocated if I'm just randomly sampling the code. I have to actually intercept those allocation calls and record that information. So MAP does use sampling, but it uses sampling by default. Start turning on other options, you're going to get a direct measurement uh, approach that's highly accurate. So you'll usually find direct measurement in community tools because it's, it's, it, it provides really good data. So I can see here that the, um, this direct measurement data is telling me that the code had, uh, found a leak on this allocate matrix B. It's this right here. And that is, the, that is a temporary matrix that, uh, well basically this is, this is the original matrix B used for the multiplication, which is then, later, which is then transposed, but that original never gets deallocated. So it, it creates matrix B, creates a transpose, copies B into transpose, but then leaves the original hanging around. And so this is, this is the source of our leak. And the reason I'm showing this offline is you typically run into links and in leaks in long running codes. Yes, go ahead. Oh, yes. How do you specify that? Is it able to interact? You're asking if you use like JE malloc or other memory yeah, allocators. You, uh, um, you can, that's a really good question. What do you want? What, so, so I'll repeat the question. It was if you are using a custom memory allocator, if you use JE malloc or some other uh, you know, non libc allocator, uh, allocator uh, you will map intercept that. Uh, not with the wrapper that ships with MAP, but this, this, is, um, this is getting into advanced territory really quick. The um, MAP supports custom metrics. You can write a little piece of C++ code that will measure anything. So you could intercept your allocators, you, whatever they might be, with the custom metric. Um, you can also do interesting things like actually intercept uh, data that's only relevant to the application using a custom metric. So I could say, you know, what is the residual in my iterative solver? I could actually show the residual in the iterative solver alongside performance data in the map profiler. So I could see floating point operations, 
and here's the residual going to zero or something like that. Or I could, you know, capture a custom allocator or a custom thread layer even. There's about 30 custom metrics, I think, um, that, that we have on, in a repo back in, back in ARM, so all kinds of crazy stuff. Yes. Hello. Hello. Good. Uh, one uh, very good tool also for memory debugging is Valgrind. Yes. Uh, how does it compare to Valgrind in terms of performance or when you run the profiling, checking how slow it is compared to Valgrind and also what is the quality of the result compared to Valgrind? Sure. So Valgrind, this, this, is, this is highlighting the reason why you might use DDT or MAP compared to single node code, right? Do you want to run Valgrind on 10,000 processors? Probably not. So you want to use DDT to uh, maybe isolate the general location of the leak, and then you could use Valgrind to dive into it deep. Or you, you might actually, at that point, once you've isolated the location in DDT, it'll be obvious why that was happening. In terms of overhead, it depends on what you want. Um, maps, or sorry, DDT's default memory debugging looks a bit like, there's, it has three levels. We have, um, Fast, oh, you can't read that at all. Sorry, it's fast, balanced, and thorough. So with fast, it's just tracking allocations more or less. Um, there'll be a couple of check fences every once in a while. It'll, it'll, you'll go back and look at the current allocations and see that things are lining up. But the performance overhead is really low. If you go all the way to thorough, then it's going to do many, many more memory checks. It's also going to start adding guard pages. Guard, um, guard pages look like this. So guard pages are where they allocate chunks of memory, usually, usually 4K, but watch out because your mini systems have huge pages and then you're really in trouble. Guard, it'll allocate guard pages around allocations so that if you stride off the end of that allocation, it raises a signal and you can capture that. So if you, turn, if you pull out all the stops, um, DDT and Valgrind will have similar performance overheads. But typically DDT is a little less, uh, the, the, the data will be of a lower quality, but the overhead will also be lower by default. Back to, okay. Well, memory debugging, actually. We're right on track because you're, you're asking all the right questions. So uh, we, we can demonstrate some of this stuff. Um, I have a tri-diagonal matrix solve code. And this is actually a really fun example because it's going to do a couple of weird things. Um, first, I'm going to run, and I'll show you that it, it does, in fact, segfall. And, and the fact that it does segfall is, is worth noting. Nope. Clean it, make it. I run in P4. Alright, we get a segmentation fault for an invalid memory reference. Now, I, I wanted to demonstrate that because in a minute, it's, this segmentation fault is going to magically disappear for no good reason. And these are the kinds of bugs I hate. Um, so, so I have a memory at, invalid memory at reference. I've already shown you how we can debug that with DDT. Alright, let's go do it. DDT. Go ahead and run it. All processes are paused right after an MPI in it. So now I'm going to click play, and I fully expect this thing to crash. Oh, OK. I, this is why I never do live demos. Um, so let me see if I can do that again. Restart the session. Now, if I do this long, long enough, it's going to complete successfully. And last night, I ran it like four times in a row, and it did work. All right, so now, because I'm presenting, this is not going not gonna to do it for me. The point is, sometimes you run this code under DDT, and you'll get the right answer. If I run it from the console, guaranteed, every time I will get the wrong answer, it will crash. Sometimes I run it from DDT, and it'll actually work. I'll get the right answer. The residual will be correct. Um, really frustrating. Why is that happening? Um, well, when DDT does memory debugging, oh, oh, I know, I'm sorry, I forgot a step. I did forget, I keep forgetting those, um, those darn memory flags. Yes, here, memory debugging. All right, I know it's a memory, memory issue, I want to debug it.
now it should work. Yes, okay, so this is the thing that, that would frustrate me no end. You run it from the command line, it crashes, you run it in the debugger with memory de debugging enabled, and it works for no apparent reason. Solution is correct. So I'm actually getting the right answer from my code in addition to it not crashing. And I could run this, I don't know, if I run it enough, it'll eventually fail, but it, it's mostly gonna work now. The debugger. Sorry? <laughs> Your debugger debugged it. My debugger debugged it. But if I, as soon as I run it from the command line again, I'll just run the same code here. Kaboom! So what's going on, right? This is, this is a bug where as soon as you look at it, the bug disappears. It's, it's really hard to see what's going on. Well, I told you that map is using a direct measurement method when it comes to memory. It is preloading a library that intercepts those allocation, and that means that these allocations have grown slightly larger, right? There's, there's some additional overhead involved in that allocation now. They're not being placed in memory in exactly the same place that they were before. This is one of the hazards of using a direct measurement approach. You're not measuring the thing you were running before. You've inserted hooks into the application. Your application is now different. You're actually profiling or debugging a different code from the one you ran before. And that's why this one is working because those additional little bits that we put around, the map went and put around the arrays have added just enough space that whatever invalid memory access is occurring is now occurring in that sort of no man's land and is safely storing a result and then later pulling that result out and I'm getting the right solution, but only if I run it from the debugger. This is extra frustrating because now the code works and the debugger is telling me everything's fine, no problem. So how do I fix that? Um, yeah, it works in DDT. Well, this is where guard pages come in. So I know, I, you know, I suspect that it's striding off the end of an array um, and it's striding into sort of no man's land that was created by DDT. So how do I prevent that? Well, you can add these guard pages, which are protected pieces of memory. And if anything gets read or written in this guard page, it will raise a signal that DDT will capture and, in, and it will tell you exactly where that invalid memory access is occurring. So to enable guard pages, Open up DDT. And under the memory debugging tab, I'm going to click add guard pages. So I can add one guard page. I can put them before or after an allocation. Um, and I can add you know, as many as I like. If, if you have 4K guard pages and you're striding over a matrix that's 10K by 10K and you're striding in the wrong dimension, then adding one 4K guard page isn't going to cut it, right? You're going to add a 4K guard page, and then it's going to stride right over that 4K into three 4K pages later. So you have to add actually three, K, three 4K pages to cover a 10K matrix. So that's just one thing to point out, right? The reason for this box is you have to think about how, how much am I likely out of bounds. Start with one, and then if it still seems to work for no good reason, just add this number, increase this number a little bit. Remembering that every single allocation is getting these, alloc these guard pages. So if I allocate two bytes, I'm going to pay the penalty of a full guard page, or maybe 10 full guard pages, if that's what I've said. So this is, this is not to be used indiscriminately. Do, do consider it. All right, so I add a guard page. I run this code again. This time it should. Yes, OK. Memory error detected at this location, read write beyond the end of an allocation. So I can pause, and it tells me there. Uh, let's get this. I'm striding from 0 to block size, res at k plus 2, k plus 2. OK, so what's wrong with this? Well, if I hover over res, I can see that res is a real kind 8 allocatable. Um, the bounds for this array, I don't know if you can read that, but they've, they've clearly been scrambled. The, the, array bounds on this allocatable array no longer makes sense to DDT. Some memory has been stomped on someplace. So we're going to have to go back and read the source code. Well, I can see here that res is allocated to be of size n. n is the first dimension of a. If I hover over that, I can see, oh, OK, a at least has preserved its dimensions. It's 4k by 4k, 4095 by 4095. So n should be 4095. Block size, also 4095. Well, here's your problem, right? Res is of size 4095, and I've written to k plus 2, which k goes from 0 to block size. So I've written beyond the end of res. So this should just be 
block size. Let's see here. 40 block size minus 2. Let me do it. I can save that. Make it run it. Looks great. 